One of the most important steps in making a smooth running railroad is having reliable wiring. So in this video, I'll step you through how I not only wire the track, but also install the control panel and connect the switch machines to make a fully functional layout ready to test some trains. In the previous video, I was working on laying track and making sure everything was aligned properly. Focusing on ensuring the track sections met up correctly and trains could roll through turnouts and track joins smoothly. In this video, I'll be getting everything wired, the control panel installed and actually getting some trains running on the track so the track layer can be put to the test. A clear and easy to understand control panel will make operating the layout much more enjoyable, especially for newcomers who aren't familiar with how your layout works. This panel is an iteration of the control panel design I did back in 2014. However, with this design, each toggle switch is centered on the track diagram, making it a bit easier to follow. I'm using LEDs again to indicate direction of the turnout. Although if you want a simpler version, you could also just use the angle of the toggle switch to indicate the direction the train will travel. The LEDs are quite bright, so to help dull them down, I not only wired in a resistor, I also lightly sanded the top of the LED to diffuse the light a little bit. I think it's much nicer to look at with the LEDs dulled down a little. The control panel itself was laser cut. This obviously makes precision easier to achieve, however you could also just as easily print out a paper template and drill the required holes in some MDF to get a similar result. Each layer of acrylic was glued together with some spray adhesive, then positioned down on top of each other. Using these screws in the four corners to help position each piece of acrylic and then pressing firmly so they stick together. When it comes to wiring, I think it's always a good idea to do a test using a breadboard. That way you can experiment with various resistors and LEDs to get the exact look and brightness you want, without committing to soldering just yet. The control panel fascia is laser engraved. Again, this can be replicated with a simple paper template and a good sharp hobby knife for those who don't have access to a laser cutter. After removing the panel, I give it a quick dusting to remove any burnt debris from the laser. Then it gets a spray of clear gloss to seal any small gaps in the protective paper sheet. That way when I spray the white and black, it shouldn't bleed under the paper. In preparation for the white, the paper center lines are peeled off. Now the white is applied. I'm using Tamiya white primer for this layer, spraying lightly to avoid any runs. Once applied, it's left to dry. Now for the black. Peeling off the remaining protective paper is so satisfying. Remember that this is the back of the panel. The front is the side still covered by the protective paper. Now with the black, goes right over the top of the white, covering all the remaining clear acrylic. I'm using Rust-Oleum Black Primer for this layer. Doing a few light coats and letting it dry between each layer of paint. Using a hairdryer can speed up the drying, however just be careful not to overheat the acrylic, as it can potentially warp. This is what the front will look like. This was actually a failed attempt, but the look will be roughly the same. And now I'm just using this piece as a bit of a template for cutting the wood and positioning the holes to be drilled into the front of the module. To mount the panel, a section of baseboard was removed to fit the panel, just wide enough to be a snug fit for the control panel. Additional wood was added to the back to give the panel something to be mounted to. These pieces are just glued in with some wood glue. And the screw holes are marked and drilled. When I do mount the panel, I use some spaces so the front of the panel is flush with the front of the benchwork. For the switches, I'm using an MP1 version 2 point motor from mtpmodel.com. These are actually wired somewhat differently to the more common tortoise and cobalt switch machines. I actually think they are a bit easier to wire. I won't go through in detail how to wire them, however here is a wiring diagram to show you how the wiring is laid out should you want to replicate this type of control panel with these switch machines. I specifically chose these for the very low profile they have. I didn't have enough space between the sub roadbed and the benchwork frame to fit larger tortoise switch machines. 
I also left the over-centering spring in the points as well. These could be removed if desired. Before mounting, I first centered the points using some styrene strips. I also center the point motor as well. The MP1 needs to be powered to make it move. So using a 12 volt supply, I add and remove power to the motor in order to get it to move. I just stop when it's centered. The throw bar is installed and tightened in place. There is so much flexibility with these switch motors, they are really easy to adjust. Now it's just a matter of placing the switch motor in position, making sure that you get the throw bar through the correct hole. Once happy, its position is marked. Holes for the screws are drilled. To help position the switch machine, I'm using some double-sided tape. This makes it a bit easier to position and hold in place as the screws are screwed in. I also make sure to test it with the 12 volt power supply before moving on, just in case it needs some adjusting. Also, the MP1 can have the throw travel adjusted. Depending on whatever scale you're working in, N, HO or O scale, they can be adjusted by opening the housing and moving the small pin on the rotating wheel to the desired spot. To adjust the pin, the front screw is loosened. Now the pin can be lowered so that it barely pokes past the throw bar on the turnout. Then just tighten the front screw back up. For some turnouts, the benchwork supports might be in the way, preventing you from getting to the screws to mount the motor. In this case, I created a paper template so that I could then use a piece of plywood to mount the motor to. This means that I can first screw the motor to the plywood template position it as I would normally to center it onto the turnout above, and then I can screw the plywood down. It just means to move the switch motor, I have some extra steps to do, but it also means I can fit the turnout in some really tight spots. Now for the track feeders. Ideally every section of track should have feeders. However, for small sections like these, I just solder the track to its adjoining piece. Relying on the rail joiners alone might work okay for brand new track, however over time the electrical connection will likely develop issues. It should only need a small amount of solder, and once painted, it will virtually disappear. For the feeder wires, I'm using 18 gauge wire. I would have preferred 22 gauge, however it's hard to find locally, so I went with the more conservative thicker gauge wire instead. Holes are drilled on the outside of each section of track where the feeders will be placed, being careful not to damage the track. The webbing between the ties also needs to be removed using a hobby knife and some tweezers to get the webbing out. Holes near the edge might need to be drilled on an angle. I roughly cut the wire to length, cutting slightly more than needed. I'm using lead solder, so be very careful not to inhale the fumes as it's toxic. Working in a well-ventilated space and having a fan to blow the fumes away from your face is a necessity. Each feeder is tinned and then bent at a right angle. Once fed through the baseboard, it's pressed up against the underside of the track. A bit of flux is used and then a soldering iron is pressed into position and solder added, trying to avoid melting the tires. Once done, I test the join by gently pulling on the feeder. If it's a good join, it should hold strong even when pulling down on the wire. This is repeated for every section of track. I'm using a tag board to attach all the feeders to. Some copper wire is soldered along each side to connect all the tags on that side. The tag board comes with eight tags on each side, but I cut them in half so I could spread them out a bit. It's very quick and easy to solder each feeder. I try to maintain a system so none of the feeders get crossed. Basically, it's black to the back. I also make sure to connect the switch motors as well. These are the frog wires, so that the frog polarity changes depending on the position of the switch. The blue wire connects from the switch machine to the frog. At the end of each module, I have a terminal block for the track bus wire and the accessory bus wire. I also drill holes for the wires to pass through along the module. For the bus I'm using twin core 18 gauge wire. It's cut to length joining the two terminal blocks on each end of the module. Wire is spliced in the middle to run up to each of the tag boards. 
making sure to have the position of the negative space far enough from the positive to prevent shorts. Those are then soldered onto the tag board, providing power to the track. The accessory bus is spliced in the same way to connect to the control panel. It's a 12 volt power supply that provides power to the accessory bus wire. For a bit of added security, I'm using liquid electrical tape to protect the exposed wires on the bus bars from shorting with each other. It needs a generous coating and can have additional coats applied after 5 or 10 minutes. To power the switch motors, I create a wire run for each unit. I design them easily to connect with a plug onto the back of the control panel. To keep the three wires that run to each motor organized, I'm using some braided sleeving. This is great for keeping the wires organized. It simply slides over the wires and works its way down. I also use some heat shrink at the ends to lock it all together and prevent the ends from fraying. To connect each module, I used automotive plugs. They are just looped down under each module and can be connected and disconnected as needed when moving the modules around. Now that the wiring is done, we can start putting it together, but it needs leveling. The easiest way to level the modules is with a laser level. This is just a cheap $50 level from Bunnings, just right for the job. I use some machinist blocks to create a guide that I can use to aim for. These will sit on the track surface, making sure the two spots are at the exact same height. I used my filming tripod to mount the laser to. The machinist blocks are placed on each end of the module, and then the laser will show you exactly the difference between each side. I lower the tripod to get the laser to match up with the high side first. My garage floor isn't level, it slopes down towards the door. So I make sure to start at the high end first, which is the side farthest from the door. I lower those feet all the way to the bottom. Then to level the module, each subsequent foot will gradually get extended as the slope drops away towards the garage door. It's just a matter of working from the high end and moving along until each module meets up with the adjoining one, adjusting the feet as needed. Once done, I use the Micromark digital level just to confirm it's 100% level. Now it's ready to test, plugging in the power and all signs are good so far. I try using a variety of trains and rolling stock to make sure everything works. The only thing I'm not testing yet are the long passenger cars as they need some modifications to navigate around the 18 inch radius curves that I have. And so far it's running beautifully. The train isn't faulting, which means all the feeder wires are doing their job. All the switches are working as they should and the polarity of the frogs are correct. If they weren't, I would get a short and the train would stop. Although it'd be quite an easy fix just by reversing the wires on the switch machine. I also make sure to run the trains through all the switches at various speeds and both forwards and reverse also, pushing and pulling different types of rolling stock. It's usually the very light cars that highlight problems, so given that my tiny four-wheel container wagons get through, is a great sign. I hope you learned something, and if you want to help support the channel, you might consider becoming a patron. I have a great community over on Patreon, and over the next few months this project progresses, I'll be spending more time there posting updates and talking to you to see what you'd like to see in future videos for this layout build series. And for the $7 patrons, you also get access to my members only area of the website where I have a collection of backdrops that can be printed for your model railroad. And you'll also have access to download items from my store as part of the patron reward. Don't forget, you can also post in the members area. You can post photos, plans, ideas, questions or whatever. I'll be checking it more regularly, so feel free to start a conversation with me over there as well. I hope you enjoyed the video. In the next video, I'll be doing the lighting. I think it's important to do the lighting before scenery because depending on the lighting you use, it can have an effect on how the scenery looks. Cheers, and thanks for watching.